following is a presentation of the Open Door Bible Baptist Church and Pastor Chris Tice. For more audio and video content, please check us out on the web at www.opendoornj.org. Good morning. 
Welcome to Open Door Live and our From House to House broadcast. We're so glad that you have chosen to join us today uh, in your house uh, for worship. And uh, we're so thankful that we can come together in this way during this time. I hope that you will gather your family together and uh, get around uh, the device that you're watching. Uh, get it up on the television if you can. Uh, kind of clear everything else out uh, for this hour or so time of uh, worship together as a church. Let's make the most of it. Let's do the best that we can. Let's put our all into worship as uh, the worship team leads us today. Let's sing if you want to stand and sing or sit, but let's just sing together uh, as a church family and uh, let's worship the Lord truly. The Lord is worthy of all worship and praise. And we're reminded so much during these times that the church is not a building. And while I'm here, in the church building, and you're not, we are the church. We are the body of Christ, and we're gathering together to worship the Lord. And Let's stay connected, and as we do this, let's all worship together. Let's, let's pray together. Let's encourage one another and provoke one another to, to love and to good works. And so I'm going to open us up in prayer, and then Pastor Brian and the worship team are going to lead us in some worship songs, and I hope that you will worship the Lord with us. Let's pray together. Would, uh, would you pray with me now as I pray? Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to come together today. We're thankful for the church. We're thankful so much for your grace in our lives. God, as we gather for this time of worship, God, I pray that you would receive praise from us. God, that you would know our hearts uh, of gratitude, Lord, towards you for all that you have done for us. God, we are so thankful for the salvation that you've delivered to us through your son, Jesus, the sacrifice that you have, have given on our behalf so that we could come into a relationship with you. God, I pray that as we are honoring you today, the Lord's day, God, that we would worship and praise you from our hearts. And God, I pray that you be pleased in all that's done today. In the name of Christ, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen.
Good morning, kids. How are we doing? This is Pastor Will here. This is my wife, Miss Audrey, and we are so excited about being here today. We love you guys. We're praying for you guys, and we want you guys to listen up. We want you to pay attention because we're going to have another great truth from God's Word today. Yes, you know, kids, sometimes we just need help. It can be with homework, with a project, or maybe it's even some things that you don't understand that you just want to understand. I'm here to tell you that it's okay to ask for help. Maybe what stops you from asking for help is maybe you don't want to bother people or maybe you're afraid of what somebody might think of you um, or maybe you think, ah, I can handle it by myself. I want you to know that your parents are there to help you. And most importantly, you can trust in God to help you. He is always there for you. And anytime we ask God for help, things always turn out so much better. And to demonstrate just that, I want to ask for Pastor Will's help, and I will be using these paper plates. Now, Pastor Will, okay. I want you to take the paper plate and put it on top of your head. All right, that's easy. Okay, I want you to take this marker. With the marker, I want you to draw, without looking, I want you to draw a flower with a stem and with a Oh, that's so easy. So easy. All okay. right. Here we go. All right. How is he going to do? What do you guys think? All right. All right. All right. Okay, let's take a look. Oh, <laughs> it looks like a boat. <laughs> it looks like a boat. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So, kids, do you think that looks like a flower? Maybe not. So that's Pastor Will doing it all by himself. Do you think he could have used some help? I think so. So what we're going to do is do this all over again, except this time we're going to pretend that I'm God. Now we all know that I am definitely not God. But Pastor Will, I want you to put this paper plate on your head again okay. and let's do it again, okay? All right, well, if you're God, I'm, I definitely want your help. I trust you. Can you help me? Of course I can. All right. Okay, so let's loosen up the fingers. All right. I'm going to help you using my hand. All right. Let's get this flower. And here is our flower. Take a look at that. Wow, that's a whole lot better. That's a whole lot better. Now, kids, the difference huh. is the power of God. When you trust in God, God uses his powerful hands. He uses his mighty hands to make things so much better than if we had done it all by ourselves. Yeah, and the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. I don't know about you, but I want to make the right choices. I want to make the right decisions. And if I'm going to do that, I'm going to need help. I don't know everything. And you know what? We don't know everything. That's why he says we need to trust in him. So we have to trust God. Who else do you think we should trust? I'll give you guys a hint. They live in your house. You should trust your parents. You should trust your guardians. You should trust your grandparents. Whoever takes care of you, you need to trust him. Now, do you just trust them a little bit? You need to trust him with all thine heart. The Bible says you need to trust him with everything that you have, everything that you have. So when you trust in the Lord and when you trust your family, you're going to make the right decisions. Every step, they're going to help you. They're going to guide you. You know, the problem that we do sometimes is we don't trust anybody. And when we don't trust anyone and we make the decisions on our own, normally we, we mess up. Normally, we make really, really big mistakes, and that's why it's important to spend time with God. That's why it's important to pray and talk to God. When you talk to Him, and you talk to Him all the time, what happens? You start to trust Him. Just like when you have a really good friend. When you have a good friend, and you talk to your friend all the time, you're going to trust your friend. When you talk to your mom, dad, whoever's taking care of you, grandma, grandpa, when you talk to them and you spend time with them, you trust them. 
when you don't talk to someone, it's going to be hard to trust them. That's why, again, it's so important for us to believe and trust in God. Because when you do that, the decisions that you make, the choices you make, they're going to be the right ones. So I want to give you guys that challenge. We love you guys. We're praying for you guys. Parents, this is a great uh, a great game to, to play with uh, with your kids. You know, while things are a little slow right now, being, you know, being in the house. So again, we love you guys. We hope you guys have a great day. Thank you for listening. And with that being said, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We're thankful for today. We're thankful for your goodness. I pray that you just continue to help us, help us to make the right decisions, help us to trust in you, Lord. And uh, I'm so thankful for everyone that uh, went online today uh, just to hear from your words. So I pray that you just Help us to listen up. I pray you feel passive with your spirit, Lord. We love you. We're so thankful for all that you do. We give you the thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Buenas tardes. Les habla Pastor Pedro González junto a mi esposa Magali González. Queremos saludarle en el nombre del Señor y darle consejo en esta tarde de que se mantenga en su casa. Si tiene que salir afuera a hacer alguna diligencia o alguna compra, por favor, hágalo y regrese lo más pronto posible. Eh, estamos aquí para ¿verdad? informarles de que se mantenga siempre activo en las cosas del Señor. Acordemos siempre de que estos son tiempos finales, lo cual la Biblia nos habla ¿verdad? en Apocalipsis, de que nos mantengamos firmes, de que estas cosas iban a pasar, iban a acontecer. Y esto es un, un poquito del principio de lo que habla la Biblia. Eh, estemos atentos de las noticias, estemos atentos de los cambios atmosféricos que nos están diciendo algo, ¿verdad? Y nos están mostrando de que Cristo viene pronto. Así que el consejo es, manténgase firme en el Señor, síganos en nuestra en los app de la Iglesia Open Doors, en la plataforma YouTube y en la plataforma Facebook. Allí estaremos dando servicio y Dios le bendiga mucho. Le esperamos. Verle pronto. Amén. En la Biblia nos dice, alabad a Dios en todo tiempo. ¿Okay? En los tiempos buenos y en los tiempos malos, Él sigue siendo nuestro Dios. En el pasado y en el presente, él sigue siendo nuestro Dios. Alabadle. Dios le bendiga. Hola, hermanos, desde Open Door Church, New Jersey. Quiero decirte que estamos orando por ti, por tu familia y por todas esas personas que en este momento no tienen para comer. Sabemos que lo que está pasando es muy grande, es muy grave, pero también sabemos y reconocemos que nuestro Dios es más grande que este problema que Él se va a manifestar. Sabemos que lo que está permitiendo, Él ya tiene su razón. Si estás hoy aquí escuchando y viendo este video, es porque todavía tú tienes un propósito. Es porque Dios tiene un propósito en tu vida. Y también quiero recordarte que, que tú estás cubierto con la sangre de nuestro Señor Jesucristo que fue derramada en esa cruz. Y también quiero decirte que ores, que clames al Señor. Jesús, mientras dormía en una barca, los discípulos enfrentaban una tempestad, una tormenta. Y sabe, la tempestad no paró al Señor. Fue la voz del discípulo cuando clamó a Él. Entonces yo te pido de corazón, busquemos al Señor, clamemos. Vamos a hacer voz para que Él se manifieste. Juan 8.32 dice, conoceréis la verdad, la verdad los hará libre. ¿Sabes lo que significa? Que el Señor te va a dar descanso, que el Señor te va a hacer libre de cualquier preocupación. Esto no es problema más grande que Él. Esto no es ningún gigante para Él. Dios tiene el control. Tu casa está siendo protegida por sus ángeles. Ninguna plaga podrá tocarte. Ninguna plaga po podrá hacerle daño a tu familia, a tus hijos, a tu esposa, a tu esposo. Quiero estimularte también a que ores, a que ores por todas las familias en el mundo. Porque ellos necesitan en este momento oración. A que ores también por esas personas que se han acercado al Señor por esta misma situación. Y que después que esto sea resuelto, ellos logren quedarse en este camino tan lindo que seguir a nuestro Dios. Que seguir dar amor por nuestro Señor Jesucristo. No hay que desmayar, no hay que dejar de escuchar la palabra y compartir, señores. Porque hay muchas personas que le hacen falta una voz de aliento, una voz de esperanza. Y si nosotros tenemos a Jesucristo en nuestro corazón, Él es luz. Entonces, si nosotros lo tenemos también, nosotros también vamos a ser luz para esas personas que en este momento viven en una oscuridad, en preocupación. Dios te bendiga y de corazón te mando un beso y un abrazo. Good morning. I'm glad that you joined us here at Open Door Online. Uh, we want to welcome you and uh, hope that you're doing well where you are and that you and your family are safe. 
Um, I want to encourage you with a verse, a very well-known verse, but to apply it um, in context today to what, to what we're facing as a world. Uh, Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. This verse takes on especially new meaning right now because, um, you know, it's not easy to see the good in, in what's going on. Certainly, I am not saying that the coronavirus, uh, you know, is good, but we do know that God is in control, that he has allowed it, that he has a plan through it. And as it says, all things work together for good to them that love God. And so what I want you and I to do for a little bit and for this week coming up, and I encourage you in this, is to make sure that you cut through all the negativity that's sort of being you're being bombarded with and it's being forced down you know our throats in many ways if you watch the news or get on social media or um, even just read things online uh, most almost everything is negative there's worry there's concern there's fear and um, but here we're told that we know that all things work together for good and so what what you and I should spend our time doing as we have a lot more of it uh, than usual uh, these days is to say, Lord, what are the blessings you've given me in my life? What are the good things that I can focus on instead of focusing on, you know, all the negative things, all the worries, all the fears that um, that you and I really can't do anything about? Certainly, we should be careful. Certainly, we should uh, do our best to be wise in how we do things. Uh, but ultimately, we have to put our faith in the Lord. There is no other option uh, from that. And perhaps that's a good thing. Maybe for yourself, you've kind of gone away from the Lord a little bit. Um, you've, uh, you know, just become wrapped up with the busyness of life, and it's been hard for you to have your focus on Him. Uh, at times like this, everything gets stripped away, and our focus turns to the Lord. Uh, maybe you can see good in the fact that you and your family are closer, or perhaps even neighbors, and, uh, you know, just people have more time and more concern for how each other are doing and, and we have the time to just sort of stop and, and care about uh, the needs of each other. Whatever you're seeing and whatever you're going through, understand that God is with you and that God has a plan uh, through all of it. And uh, his hope is that you will see and know that he is good in no matter what the circumstance. And so I encourage you, stay safe with your family. Uh, we here at Open Door love you and if there's any way we can help you please uh, don't hesitate to reach out and let us know this is a time when we can come together and truly show the love of christ to those around us i'm going to pray for uh, this morning's service and uh, again we're looking forward to god blessing us through the time of worship and uh, and and uh, preaching that will follow let's pray lord we love you we thank you and we praise you, Lord, for how good you are to us, Lord. That doesn't change just because some of the circumstances of our life change or some of the things we're faced with change. Lord, your goodness is always there. And Father, we're grateful um, that you saved us, Lord. You died on the cross for us. You took what would be the worst thing that could happen to anyone in this world, in this life. You took death. And Lord, you did it for us because you loved us. So Lord, we are grateful for that. Um, it gives us something to to be thankful for. It gives us peace and encouragement and comfort. And Lord, it gives us salvation. And for that, we are truly grateful. Lord, I pray now that you would bless our time together. Lord, though it's in a different setting, we're all kind of in our own places watching it online. Lord, I pray that we could still be encouraged through your word and understand that your spirit uh, is not limited to a building or even a gathering. But Lord, your spirit is at work all over the world, Lord, and, and for that we're grateful. Father, may we be able to see that as, as the sea of negativity flows all around us, Lord, with uh, the virus and, and some of the reports and predictions and, and worries that we can face. Lord, may we be able to see you at work. Lord, open our eyes to see the truth of that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. Hope everyone is well. We miss everybody. We're gonna pray for today's service. Hope you guys are all doing well. Father, we thank you so much, dear God, that we uh, assemble, dear God, from house to house as a church. And Lord, we know even though our 
lives have been disrupted, Father, by this virus. We thank you, dear God, that your church still thrives and that we can come together as a body of believers uh, through uh, media, through streaming, and Lord, we're thankful for that. We pray that you would continue to knit our hearts together, that you would keep us close. Father, that uh, we would uh, still love each other, be supportive of one another. And dear God, as we hear the message today, Father, we pray that your word would speak mightily to us, that by your spirit, dear God, you would open our hearts to see the wonderful things that are in your law, dear God, how Christ died for sinners, Father, and that he saved us and redeemed us, and that by repentance and faith, Father, we could have eternal life through our glorious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So now, God, as we hear, we pray that you would give Pastor Tice wisdom as he brings the word to us, that you would bless us, so that you would uh, bless everybody in our congregation, and even in, throughout the world, Father, that you would bring healing from this virus, and dear God, that you would uh, give our local officials, our state officials, and our federal officials, Father, all wisdom, Father, concerning this, dear God. And I pray, Father, that they would be praying for this, and uh, that, dear God, they would honor you in all the decisions that they make. So, dear God, bless us now as we commune as a church and hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you jesus the name above every the only one who could ever say Show me. 
I'm so glad for that time of worship that we were able to share together as a church family, to be able to hear from all these uh, different homes today, and uh, just makes me more appreciative for the wonderful church family that God has given us. We're going to continue today in our series in the book of Galatians called Plus Nothing. We're talking about the gospel, and we see as we go through the book of Galatians that the gospel was threatened there uh, with the Galatian Christians uh, as they were following Christ, uh, they were interrupted. We talked about last week, they were running the race that God had set before them, and someone had hindered them in that race. I know that we could probably all identify that. Many of us in our Christian life have been running a race, and uh, we know that as we're continuing forward as believers, sometimes we get to points to where the Bible tells us we were running, but now there's sin or weights that need to be laid aside so that we can look to Jesus. We need to get the obstacles out of the way so that we can continue to grow. Healthy Christians grow. And when we're not growing, we're not healthy. And many of the times we're not healthy, it's because we've taken on burdens and we've taken on things into our lives that the Bible warns us about. And Paul continues with these warnings as we go to the book of Galatians together. Take your Bibles with me. Go to Galatians chapter number 5. And, I, and uh, we'll pick up in verse number 16 and we'll read down. Uh, to verse number 25 this morning. Join me as we look to the Word of God. The Bible says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. This is the Word of the Lord. Shall we pray together this morning? Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity now to open Your Word together. God, I pray that no matter who is listening, no matter where they are, as we are ministering from house to house today as the body of Christ, God, that You would speak into our hearts, that You would use this broadcast, God, to change lives, that You would use Your Word to stir us up to greater obedience. God, to stir us up to greater love for our Savior, Jesus Christ. That you'd help us in our Christian life to continue to grow through the gospel. We're reminded, Lord, that you saved us by grace. That the gospel is what brought salvation to us. But also, we're reminded today that it is through the gospel that we continue to grow as Christians. Bless us today as we look to your word. I pray that your spirit would teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. In normal religion, the motivation for doing good or right is fear-based. But in the gospel and in Christianity, the motivation is a dynamic love, as we saw in chapter 5. And now Paul spells out how we grow in character, how we continue to grow as believers, but he introduces to us what he indicates to us as a struggle between our flesh and the Spirit. I don't know about you, but when I became a believer, I had kind of the thought that now that I'm a child of God, I'm no longer going to struggle with sin. I'm no longer going to desire to do things that are wrong. As a matter of fact, when those opportunities are given to me to do wrong, I'll be able to just overcome them easily. And I might not even be even tempted to do those things. As someone who's been saved for a number of years, I can tell you this, that while there have been some desires that have ceased in my life, 
as I've grown, I've seen the things that have been destructive and, and because of the nature of those things, I don't even want them to be in my life anymore. But I wish I could say that I don't desire to sin. I wish I could tell you today that I don't sin. You might think that that's surprising coming from a pastor that tells you that he's a sinner. But the truth is, the Bible tells us that we're all sinners, and that's why we need the gospel. But when we become children of God and we enter into a relationship with God, our desire for sin doesn't cease. As a matter of fact, sometimes what happens to us is we're introduced to something that we're not used to. We thought the Christian life might be an easy life, but what we find out is what Paul is telling us here in this passage, that the Christian life is a war. The Christian life is a battle. The Christian life is a struggle. And the first point that I want to bring to you today is the struggle that Paul is telling us that there will be struggles, that there are two natures at work in every Christian, the spirit and the sinful nature. Look at verse number 16. This I say, then walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He's telling us that there's two desires. There's a desire in the Christian that is God's desire. God's spirit in you desires good things. We find out later in the chapter what he means by those good things. It is the fruit of the Spirit that God's Spirit desires. What does God's Spirit desire? He desires love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. He desires those things in your life. We can see what the flesh desires. He spells them out in the chapter. Look at it with me. He says the works of the flesh in verse 19 are sexual in nature. Sexual desires, that's what the flesh desires. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Not only do we see sexual desires, but we see superstitious desires. A desire to be drawn into spiritual superstition. Um, Things that would attract us in such a way that would mean to us that if we do certain things, if we have some kind of charm, or we have some kind of rock, or we have some kind of crystal, or whatever it is that, that we can somehow conjure through ourself and the worship of ourself or the worship of nature or in the world that we could accomplish what we would desire to accomplish. We could become like God and we're God in our, own, in our own life. And he begins talking about those sins, the desires of the flesh, when he says idolatry, witchcraft. And then he talks about what happens as a result of in our relationships when we give in to these desires These fruits end up being hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings. And then notice it gets even further and even more extreme, murder as a result of these things. The Bible is telling us that these sins exist in our society. Look at, he goes even further in verse 21. He talks about drunkenness and revelings. These are addictive sins. This is substance abuse that he's talking about. There are people and you might even be listening today and you're struggling yourself with substance abuse and you have a a, a battle that's going on in your life and you cannot break the bond of that sin in your life. And that is because your flesh desires those things. And in the Christian life, we know that we can still be drawn into those things. But the Bible says that those that live this kind of life, those that give in to these sins and live them out habitually, will not inherit the kingdom of God. What a warning to us. As we understand, we need to be set free from these sins. Paul reminded the Christians at the beginning of the chapter, you've been set free to stay free. Don't go back into sin, but don't go back to religion and to your pride. And so he talks about this struggle between the flesh and the spirit. David Prowlson has a very helpful insight on this, and he said this, if idolatry is the characteristic and summary Old Testament word for our drift from God, then desires is the characteristic in summary New Testament word for that same drift. The New Testament merges the concept of idolatry and the concept of inordinate life-ruling desires for lust, craving, yearning, and greedy demand. One of the most intriguing statements here is when Paul literally says in verse number 17, look what he says, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. 
The Bible is literally saying here that the flesh fights against the Spirit. That the flesh battles with, struggles with the Spirit. And so uh, many of us would say today that we understand that struggle. And maybe you are having that struggle in your life. Can I say this? People who don't know God and are not in a relationship with God don't struggle with sin. As a matter of fact, they don't see any problem with sin. They can just sin in their lives and have no struggle, no battle, no conflict within them. It's just a normal part of their life. But for Christians, when we sin, it's not fear of what other people might think of us that causes us to struggle. It's not fear of failure that causes us to struggle. It's in our lives that we know inside of us that we have done wrong and hurt the fellowship that we have with our God and that relationship. And so Paul talks about this struggle. He says this, the Spirit longs to show us Christ and to conform us to Christ. And this is what the Christian wants. We want to be conformed to the image of Christ. We want to be transformed. We want to be like Jesus. Christians look at Christ and say, that's my goal. That's the way I want to live my life. Living the way of the Spirit is what we most deeply want. Yet the sinful nature continues to generate alternative, competing desires which we experience and can give into, but which now contradict our most abiding love and goals as believers. The born-again Christian has both sinful desires and godly desires, but we most truly want what our spirit-renewed heart wants. This statement is filled with hope and affirmation. Even when we're falling into sin, we can say with Paul, this is not really me. This is not what I really want. I want God and His will. If that's you today as a believer, you know as you're living the Christian life, you're going to fall. The Bible says a just man falleth seven times and riseth again. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way though he fall. He shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. The Bible tells us that we are firmly in the Father's hand, and no one or anything can pluck us out of it. It further tells us that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. See, we have not come into the family and been born again through our works, and so we cannot lose our relationship with God through our bad works. But I'm going to tell you today, if you truly are a believer, when you fail, you're saying like Paul, this is not my life. This is not how I've been this is not how I've been meant to live. This is not the life I should be living. I want better. I want to live the life that Jesus Christ saved me to live. And if you're thinking in your life right now that there are some changes that need to be made, it's very simple. You need to put away the desires of the flesh. You need to say no. You need to stand up to them. You need to empty yourself of things and desires and actions that are in your life that the Bible says don't please Him. There's a striking parallelism between verse 16 and verse 18. He says in verse 16, we're to live by the Spirit. We're to be led by the Spirit. In contrast to choosing to gratify the sinful nature or to be under the law. Look at verse number 18, but if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. What's he saying? For Paul, these two things are either very closely linked or even just different ways of speaking about the same thing. This tells us not just something about the actions of the sinful nature, but also about the motives of the sinful nature. Not just that it disobeys God, but why it wants to. The question that we should be asking ourselves is not why do I sin, but why do I want to sin? Why do I desire to sin? Why is there something in me that desires to do wrong, that desires to hurt myself, that desires to hurt others. What is the motivation of that? Religion never motivates us to do right for the right reasons. You may quit a lot of things as a religious person. You may start doing a lot of good things as a religious person. The problem is, is that you will be motivated to do so, so that people would think well of you, so that you can gain acceptance with God. And when you do fail, You'll think, I failed, it's over. I can never get back what I've done. The truth is, is that Jesus saves us from the penalty of sin 
But the presence of sin is still in our lives through the works of the flesh. But God has given us His Spirit. And His Spirit is powerful. His Spirit has the power to overcome our desires. Meaning, it's not that you look into yourself and say, I need to try harder. I need to stop doing these things. I'm really going to set my mind and my heart to do these things. But rather say, why do I want to do something that hurts me, that hurts others, that hurts God? Do I love God? Those that are in Christ love God. Those that are not in Christ love themselves, love their sin, and love this world. In light of this, we can say, see that the two natures Paul speaks of are rarely, or really rather, two semi-intact motivational systems within us. Motivation is why I do what I do. A motivational system is centered on a goal that the imagination finds beautiful and desirable. This goal generates what we perceive as needs and manufactures drives to attain the things that we believe that we need. The sinful nature is really our old motivational system. It's why we did everything that we did before, with its own goals and its own needs and its own drives, still somewhat intact. It's focusing on some object that is in itself good, but which turns into an idol by which we seek our own salvation. We say this in ourselves, I can have worth if I'm loved, if I have a good career, if my children love me. And that finally creates over-desire for that idol in our lives. Notice, as we look at verses 19 through 21, he gives this list of what the flesh wants. We spoke about them in the beginning of the message, but let me draw your attention back to them because he says that the acts of the sinful nature are these. They're not all actions. They're attitudes which are just as much sins in our lives. In other words, it's not just actions that we need to pay attention to. It's the attitudes in our life. There's three words in verse number 19, again, having to do with the works of the flesh in the area of sexuality. He talks about sexual immorality. That's sexual intercourse between unmarried people. And he says, this is wrong. Unmarried people are not supposed to be engaging in sex. That's a sin. I understand that that's not popular in our culture, but the Bible tells us this is destructive. If you enter into sexual relationships outside the bond of marriage, you will bring destruction to your own self. The Bible says you sin even against your own soul. And that he talks about these sexual sins. He talks about these practices, making good things like careers into, into gods, and uh, he, these unnatural sexual practices and relationships and uncontrolled sexuality. Then in verses 20 to 21, he gives us eight words that describe how the flesh destroys relationships. And I don't know about you, if you've struggled in your relationships, you should really pay attention to this list because the flesh desires these things and all of these things destroy the relationships around us. Four of these are destructive attitudes. Notice he talks about selfish ambition, competitive, competitiveness, a self-seeking motive, envy, coveting, desiring what others have, jealousy, the zeal and energy that comes from a hungry ego, hatred, uh, hostility, an adversarial attitude. Look at verses 20 and 21, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders. He talks about these words. He says, these things destroy our relationships. Four describe the results of these attitudes in relationships. Discord, being argumentative, seeking to pick fights, fits of rage, outbursts of anger, divisions between people and factions. And finally, there's two words, again, that refer to substance abuse, drunkenness, and revelings. And this is what Paul is describing to us. This, to break down this list into categories is to notice that some of the sins are the characteristics of religious people, selfishness, envy, jealousy, factions, divisiveness, while others are more characteristic of non-religious people, immorality, drunkenness. And this list shows us that God does not make the kind of distinctions that we commonly do. Uh, you know, sometimes what we do, we see sex and drinking as more sinful than jealousy and ambition. It undermines the tendency of naturally non-religious people to label the flaws of someone else's religion, 
religious actions as, as being worse than ours, and of religious people to see the works of non-religious as terrible and worse than them. We're much better at noticing the works of someone else's sinful nature than we are at seeing our own. But he talks about this next section in verse number 18 about being led by the Spirit. Being led by the Spirit is to change. To be changed is to be the people that God made us to be, to be transformed. The Spirit-fueled development of Christ-like character is liberating because it, it brings us closer to being the people we were designed to be. Think about this. Why did Paul call these things fruit? Paul always chose his, his illustrations and these images carefully. It's very revealing that he talks about acts of sinful nature, but then he switches to this fruit of the Spirit. Two different words there, uh, between the fruit of the flesh, or the works of the flesh, rather, and the fruit of the Spirit. The acts of the sinful flesh, and the fruit of the Spirit. The single word fruit, it takes us to the world of agriculture. It tells us four things about how the Spirit works. And let me give them to you this morning. First, Christian growth is gradual. Like fruit, as gradual as a turnip or a potato growing with botanical growth, you never see it happening. You can only measure it after time. And with the growth of the fruit of the Spirit, it might be growing in a Christian's life, but they never realize it until some trouble or difficulty shows up in their lives. All the growth is first underground. It can't be seen by others. It's something that is growing, but it's gradual. Secondly, the growth of the Spirit's fruit is ine inevitable. It's going to happen in our lives. There will be growth. There's a story about a man who, when he died, he was buried under a marble slab, and somehow an acorn got into his grave. And over time, gradually and unnoticed, the acorn grew. And eventually, it split open the marble, such, as, such was its power, marble or a tiny seed. If you don't know about how things grow, you'd bet on the marble. But of course, in fact, the money should be on the acorn. If someone has the Spirit in them, if they are a Christian, the fruit will grow. Whatever a Christian's life is like, the fruit of the Spirit is going to burst through powerfully. It's going to break up things that you may think are so strong that cannot be broken. But mark it down. As a believer, this growth in your life is going to come. It's gradual, but it's inevitable. It's going to take place. And the most powerful things that are in your life that are strongholds can be broken down through the power of the Spirit. That should give us hope as believers as we understand we all struggle and we all battle and we all face things uh, that are detrimental in our lives as we struggle with the flesh. But if we have the Spirit, we have hope. This is encouraging to us as we think of how marble-like our sinful nature is. But it's also challenging. It forces us to ask, if we've been Christians for a few years or more, this question. Is there fruit growing in my life? I wonder today, would you just, where you're at, ask yourself that question? I say I'm a Christian. I say I'm a child of God. But is there fruit growing in my life? You might say, what fruit? The fruit of the list here. Love. Not love for self. Not love for the world. But charity. Agape love. The love of God. Selfless, sacrificial love. The love that can love an enemy. The love that can forgive. The love that can overcome all things. The love that never fails. The love that is offered freely. The love that is unselfish. 1 Corinthians 13, kind of love. That kind of love. Do you see that love in your life? Joy. I'm not talking about happiness because of your circumstances, because you get the raise that you wanted, or because you accomplish the things that you desire. I'm talking about joy. The joy of the Lord, which is your strength. This is a fruit of God's Spirit. God wants to produce this in you. It's a joy that cannot be robbed from you. No matter what your circumstances, no matter what you're facing, you are driven by this joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. The joy of the Lord. Peace. Boy, are you living in fear? Or would your life be categorized as peaceful? Someone who's at peace with God because they have the peace of God. Also, I can think of how peace works its way out in our lives. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Are you looking for a fight? Or are you a peacemaker? Do you seek to brawl and engage with people in ways that are uh, brutal? Do you look to 
argue with people? Do you look to struggle with people? That's often because there's a struggle within you that's coming and spilling out onto other people. But the fruit of God's Spirit brings in you a peace that works its way out of you and makes you a peacemaker. And that's the upward growth. The the lower growth is the peace with God, the peace of God. And then inside of us comes up, springing up out of the ground where people can begin to see it. We become, who are at peace, become at peace with others around us. We become peacemakers. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. Think about it. Do you have patience? Are you gentle? Faith, meekness, temperance, all of these things that Paul is talking about. The third thing I want to point out, first, that growth is gradual. Second, that the Spirit's fruit is inevitable, the growth of that fruit. Thirdly, the fruit of the Spirit has internal roots. It's not about traits or characteristics. It's about a change that's much deeper than that. Think about an apple tree. Do the apples on the tree make it alive? Does the fruit make the tree alive? No. If you tied apples onto a dead tree's branches, that wouldn't make it alive. The apples don't give life. They are a sign that the tree is alive. But if the life produces the fruit, it's the life rather that produces the fruit, not the other way around. Think about that. God is not saying that you can do fruit and that can make you alive. He's saying if you're alive, there will be fruit on your life. Sometimes we try it the other way. We try to do things in order to become alive. We feel dead inside, and we think if we start doing good things, it's going to make us feel alive inside. Friend, the only thing that's going to give you life, that's going to spring up in you, that's going to revive your heart, that's going to thrill your soul, is the faith and trust in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We tend to see gifts as sign of the Spirit's work in someone. But it's interesting. The Bible never says that gifts are signs of the Spirit's work. Judas and King Saul were both used by the Spirit to prophesy, prophesy, which is a gift. They were used by the Spirit to do miracles, but they didn't have Spirit-renewed hearts. To be truly led by the Spirit is to grow in the fruit of the Spirit. Think about this. Unbelievers can produce and act in spiritual ways. God can enable the unbelieving leaders in our world to do wonderful things because they have gifts. They're wise or they're able to say things that, you know, uh, that come to pass in life. They can, we can see things happen through them. It doesn't mean that they're children of God. But God says the evidence of a renewed heart, someone who's a believer, should not be looking for gifts, but looking for fruit. Fourthly, Christian growth is symmetrical. Let me explain that. Paul deliberately uses the singular word fruit. He doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit. He says the fruit of the Spirit to describe an adjective list of things that grow in a Spirit-filled person. He's not saying pick and choose. He's saying if I was to describe the fruit of the Spirit, it would be this way. It's like if you described an apple. It would be the description of that fruit. And Paul is describing the singular fruit of the Spirit of God. So we don't pick and choose. We understand that these are all part of what God produces in our life. Um, Jonathan Edwards put it like this. There is a concentration of the graces of Christianity. That is, you do not get one part of the fruit of the Spirit growing without all the other parts growing. When we look at this list of fruits, we notice that we're naturally stronger in some than in others, but our strengths, apart from the Holy Spirit, are due to natural temperament. We have a trait through brain chemistry or early training or to natural self-interest. We learned a trait in order to handle some issue or condition we met. But uh, as we look at this passage, the sign that is is not due to the work of the Holy Spirit is that uh, such people are usually not bold or courageous. Faithfulness. Because of what Paul says about the unity of the fruit, that means that this sort of gentleness is not real spiritual humility, but just temperamental sweetness. Some people have a sweetness about them, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the fruit of God's Spirit. John says this, if anyone says, I love God, and he hateth his brother, he's a liar. It's an interesting thing. Notice he doesn't say if a man loves God, but doesn't love his brother. He's unbalanced. 
No, he's saying he's a liar. He didn't say he's unbalanced. He needs to grow in that area. He's saying he doesn't love God. True love to God is always accompanied by love to others. Love and kindness are both part of the same fruit. If they're not both there, then neither are there at all. There are many uh, cases of this. Some folks seem happy and bubbly, like they have joy and are good at meeting new people, but are very unreliable and cannot keep friends, faithfulness. This is not real joy, but just being an extrovert by nature. Some people seem very unbothered or peaceful, but they're not kind or gentle. This is not real peace. I think sometimes we, we look at our characteristics or the things that uh, make our personality, and we think these are the fruit of the Spirit. No, Paul is saying here that all of these things describe the fruit of the Spirit. The parts of the fruit, it's worth looking closely at each one. Notice he says love. He's saying it means to serve a person for their good, intrinsic value, not for what the person brings you. It's the opposite of fear. Fear is self-protection. It's abusing people. He says joy. It's a delight in God for the sheer beauty and worth of who He is. Peace, a confidence and rest in the wisdom and control of God rather than in your own. Patience, long-suffering, He says. An ability to face trouble without blowing up. It's the opposite of resentment towards God and others. Its counterfeits are cynicism or a lack of care that is too... Uh, this is too small to care about. I, I look at people and things and say they're too small to care about. Kindness. It's an ability to serve others practically in a way that makes me vulnerable. Goodness. That's integrity. It's being the same person in every situation. It's being consistent rather than being a phony or a hypocrite. He says faithfulness. That's loyalty. Courage. To be utterly reliable and true to your word. Gentleness. The opposite is to be superior, self-absorbed. He's talking about humility, self-forgetfulness. And then self-control, the ability to pursue the important over the urgent rather than to be always impulsive and uncontrolled. How can we grow the fruit of the Spirit? How can the fruit of the Spirit take root in our hearts and be produced in our lives? Paul immediately supplies the answer. He says it in verse number 24. Look at it with me. We're almost done. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. We need to remember first that we belong to Jesus. All that is His is ours. Our approval and welcome from the Father rests not in our character or actions, but on His will. Secondly, because we belong to Christ, we have crucified the sinful nature of with its affections and lusts. Crucifying the sinful nature. It's dismantling the idols. It means to put an end to the ruling and attractive power that idols have here in our lives. To destroy their ability to inflame our thoughts and our desires. We have to ask ourselves, not just what we do wrong, but why we do wrong. We disobey God in order to get something we feel we must have. That's that flesh, that over-desire. Why must we have it? Because it's a way we're trying to keep under the law. It's something we have to come to believe will authenticate us, will make us genuine as people. To crucify the sinful nature is to say, Lord, my heart thinks that I must have this thing, otherwise I have no value. It's not a real Savior. It's a false Savior. But to think and feel and live like this is to forget what I mean to you, how you see me in Christ, By your Spirit, I need to reflect on your love for me and Him until this thing loses its its attractive power over my soul. Paul is not simply saying, just say no to sin. He's saying that these desires, our flesh desires to live under the law in some way. It's instinctively desiring to to be our own Savior, to, to save ourselves, just to say no without examining the motives underneath wrong behavior can actually be a form of self-righteousness in our lives. Paul is not talking about a passive process. A Christian can say, I've been crucified with Christ. Like chapter 2 and verse 20, as Paul said that. As something that has been done to us, 
that we're free from the condemnation of sin as if we had, uh, as if we had already paid the penalty ourselves with our own death. Christ's death was our death. But chapter 5, verse 24 is talking about not just that you've been crucified with Christ and you are now in Christ, but that you are in an ongoing crucifixion, which we ourselves do to our sinful nature as we put, the, put to death the flesh and its desires in our lives. That's literally what he's saying. So what's he telling us to do? Keep in step with the Spirit. Look verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. What does it mean to walk with someone? It means to keep in step with them. If you want to walk in the Spirit, it's that simple. Keep in step with the Spirit. The Spirit is walking and leading. You need to stay in step with Him. The flesh desires for everyone else to keep in step with it. The flesh is driving you to do things that dishonor God. But how I crucify the flesh is by saying no to those things, by going deeper and saying no to their motives, but also by us looking at Christ and saying, you are the one that I need to emulate, the one that I desire to be like, the one that is my Savior. I'm not the Savior. You're the Savior. That's what we, look, that's what we say when we look at Christ. This is not just an intellectual exercise. We worship Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit. We adore Him until our hearts find Him more beautiful than the things that we at one time desired. And when we do that, we put to death the flesh. We crucify the flesh with its affections and lusts. We clear room for the fruit of the Spirit to grow. It's kind of like weeding the garden. You remove the growth that's bad so that you can see the growth that's good. God wants to produce spiritual fruit. It's inevitable in the life of the Christian. It's going to take place. And God describes that fruit. I wonder today as we close, are you a believer? Have you been born again? Do you know if you were to die today that you'd go to heaven? Or would you have some doubts about that? Are you just a religious person trying to live a good life? Or are you knowing that you're not religious at all and you're just struggling in your sin nature? and your desire to do things that are wrong. If I could tell you how you could be in a relationship with God, free from the bonds of sin, and have a a promise of being forever with God in a wonderful place called heaven, wouldn't you want to know if there was a guarantee for that? The Bible says that there is. The Bible tells us that Jesus loved us so much, and God revealed and demonstrated that love to us that while we were yet sinners, Christ Himself took on human flesh, became a man, lived as a man a sinless life, and He died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible tells us that we must believe. The Bible says, As many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, salvation is in Christ. The Bible says there is salvation in nobody else. For There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. Can I tell you that Jesus saves? Jesus can be your Savior. You know, you may be struggling in your life to be your own Savior to be your wife's Savior, to be your children's Savior. You may be struggling to overcome different things that are in your life today, but I can tell you that none of us can be our own saviors. Our flesh will drive us and drive us and drive us and eventually break us and all the relationships around us. You may be watching this and you may be alone because you've already seen the destruction of sin in your life. You may be religious and see the destruction of that. After all your good works, after all your trying, you're still stuck feeling like a failure because you can't keep all of the law. Can I tell you that Jesus kept and fulfilled the whole law for you that are religious? That He spoke to Nicodemus at night and told him this, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Are you in the Spirit? The Bible says if you're in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. Don't fulfill the lusts of your flesh. 
Maybe you're a believer today and you're struggling with some habitual sins in your life. You have what the Bible would call sins that easily beset you. Can I share with you, the struggle is real in every Christian's life. We must crucify the flesh. What do we do? We have to every day have this ongoing crucifixion. What do we do? We preach the gospel to ourselves. Every single day, we remind ourselves that we are sinners, that we are saved by the grace of God. And through that grace, we can be free on a daily basis from the desires that are in our lives that cause us more and more destruction and destruction in relationships around us. You say, what do I do, Pastor? It's simple. Cry out to God. Ask Him to forgive you for your sins. Ask Him. Tell Him, I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that you come, came to die for me. I believe that you're the way, as you said, the truth and the life. And I want to have a relationship with God. As a Christian, if you want to be free, repent of your sin. Turn away from your sin toward God. And ask God to help you walk in step with His Spirit. Let's pray and ask God today to help us to do so. Father, I thank You so much for this time in Your Word. I thank You for Your grace, God, as we have received it, God, by faith. Lord, I pray today, if there be, be someone watching today that has never had a time in their life where they were born again, where they put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, where uh, there may be some that are watching and said, I don't have, I might have a personality that's kind or joyful, I'm good to people. So I, I think I have the fruit of the Spirit. But what about that whole list, that whole description? You're saying, I don't have all of those things. I'm not saying you're perfect in all those things. But what I'm asking is, do you have fruit in your life? that shows that you're a child of God? If you don't, boy, you need to search your heart today. God, I pray that You'd help us all to examine ourselves. God, I pray that You'd help us that call ourselves Christians to live the Christian life walking in the Spirit and not fulfilling the lusts of our flesh. As uh, the worship team leads us in another song, I hope that you will, right where you're at, take this time as they lead us in worship, to pray and to talk to God about what He talked to you about. When peace like a river attendeth my way When sorrows like sea billows roll
Thanks so much for tuning in today to uh, this episode of Open Door Live in our House to House broadcast. We're so thankful that we can uh, continue to worship together, and I'm so thankful for the Word of God and how we were led in worship today to hear from people from different houses uh, and uh, just stay connected. And as we continue to move forward as a church, let's remember our tithes and our offerings You'll be able to give to the church simply by going to opendoornj.church and clicking on the Give link. That information will be right here on the screen for you, or you can mail in your gift to the church office. And again, that information will be there for you. And that we're so thankful for your giving and for your faithfulness to that during this time. We're praying for you, and we know that God will supply our needs as we are faithful to be obedient to Him in our worship, in our tithes, and in our offerings. As we continue to gather, uh, let's remember this week uh, our life groups time. I hope that you'll join us uh, online for those times and look for a special broadcast. We'll be having some uh, different broadcasts throughout the week to continue to minister to you where you are. And then do me a favor, church. Reach out to some people today. Uh, share uh, some testimonies. Make a, maybe make a phone call to two or three people in our church family and just encourage them. And we're so thankful that God has given us such a great family here and a great church family. And we're so thankful for His grace in our lives. God bless you. If God has used this ministry in any way to be a blessing to you, please take a moment to send us an email to info at opendoornj.org. Also, if you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so online at opendoornj.org. Thanks for tuning in.